TV radio listeners, this is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Thank you for joining us. Today is Monday, and as you know, on Mondays I like to interview uh, activists and concerned citizens and to find out what's going on in St. Louis. Uh, many of you know or frankly attempt to ignore the fact that we have a uh, dump site, a fuse wrap dump site on fire in St. Louis that is now burning, I believe it's burning nuclear radiation. It's right next to it, 300 feet away. They don't know where it's at. So uh, today I have with us Drew Kuhn from the Missouri Accountability Project. So I'm going to jump right in and let Drew uh, join us. Thank you for joining us, Drew. Thank you for having me, Lonnie, and thanks to your listeners for tuning in today. Beautiful Monday, I assume. This is a (laughs) pre-recorded interview, but um, Lonnie and I will be talking about um, the <clears throat> environmental, public health, and safety um, issues, St. Louis, and how they relate uh, nationally. And um, I'm, as stated, um, an organizer with Missouri Accountability Project. Uh, org is our website. Uh, you can visit us there to find uh, latest news reports, aggregated reporting um, on issues, particularly concerning Missouri. Um, but Again, also, I think there's something we can learn from everyone. So uh, thanks again for for having me on. Well, thank you. And let me give the date because today is uh, July 17th. We plan on playing this interview tomorrow on uh, July 18th. So it probably will be a gray day here in Eugene. I mean, it's usually a little bit overcast, and then it becomes... It becomes geoengineered, and then we start getting the geoengineering. That's kind of what's happening. It should be blue, but not always. Uh, look, I really appreciate. This is the thing about the geoengineering, even the projects. What what St. Louis is suffering from is the very same thing. Uh, it's the secrecy from World War II, isn't it, Drew? It, this is the uranium that was buried secretly, sold secretly. There's a quagmire of lack of accountability. Yeah, and I think that's what we're suffering from um, more broadly that um, other places in Asia can relate from. If I may share a short excerpt about our uh, our particular situation here Please in Missouri. Do. Please do. Um, this was written in 2014 um, by Dan Norris, a previous employee of um, Missouri Department of Natural Resources. What's the he person's says he, name? Excuse me, what's the person's name? Dan Norris, N-O-R-I-S. Norris. Uh, the, current, the current Office of Public Information at DNR and the Governor's Office is nothing short of information control. 
News is constantly spun in a manner to try and make everything look good. While there's a fair amount of good news to report on, many of the aspects that a regulatory agency deals with are simply not that cheering, cheery or uplifting. It is an insult to the intellect of the public to try and paint a positive picture out of something that just isn't positive. In many cases, public information doesn't happen anymore unless if it's bad news. Uh, we should not allow ourselves to live in a society where public officials are impeded the free flow of information to the public who they are elected to represent. Yet, that is where we find ourselves today. The direction of the current governor's administration and the degree of bureaucracy in the state government has left many dedicated employees on both sides of the political spectrum looking for the exit or counting down the days until they are eligible to retire. Part of my decision to leave my position with Missouri DNR is because overall disappointment with how we were able to perform our job and anger at the degree to which bureaucracy consumes day-to-day -day progress. During my time in Missouri, there have been political pushes resulting in disproportionate power for industry while reducing the rights and power of individual citizens. Politics and fear, unfortunately, are more powerful than science and reason. I wish all Missourians the best in regaining their voice and obtaining a governance structure that represents the diverse interests of the state as a whole rather than just those with political power. Um, so what I think we suffer from is uh, a result of our system. Um, and locally, um, what we wanted to do, um, many of us wanted to do, and I got to doing that um, I think this letter hits on is um, reminding citizens of their individual rights um, and, and the power that they have in their voice and to try to inform that voice by aggregating reporting um, so they can hold our regulatory agencies accountable. And so um, that's, in a sense, what we're trying to accomplish with Missouri Accountability Project. And, you know, I know we, we've discussed this before. St. Louis has a long history of uh, radioactive waste, um, a legacy of it, and uh, at the same time, it's not just the nuclear industry. It's it's chemical pollutants. It's the PCBs um, and I dioxin at times. Speech legacy. I reject that phrase. That's like them trying to sugarcoat it. A yeah, legacy. I think it, it kind of that insinuates kind of pride. You know, it's doesn't it kind of like, insinuate a pride yeah, that like, you're like, oh, oh it's something that we've built, but yeah, it, so and it's it is something that we've built, but it's nothing to be proud of. It's um, not a legacy. It's an insult. It's an ignored crime. It's really the our government abusing an entire city, allowing people to move, build. I mean, Rob, Rob uh, Frund, the man that was on friend who was on our show. He is mortified. He helped build houses out there. He had no idea. That's outrageous to put that kind of emotional trauma on on developers and pe you know people that own those houses. They don't even want to sell their houses. Hmm. That's well, you know, what, what, then there's the people that that were that were bought out, and so you have this land that mm -hmm. you know is just like um, Carrollton. Many people aren't familiar with that, except for probably maybe the. 500 people that live in this radius, but was a large um, tract of land, a very large tract of land next to the landfill in the airport that was bought out with eminent domain by the airport for new, uh, for new landing strips. And I don't know if any of your listeners have flown into Lambert, but we have a massive airport that we use a fraction of. Um, so yeah, there's, there's many ways I think to skirt around accountability for environmental degradation and I think it's on us in some part to um, to ask, ask the hard questions, uh, to ask why, and to, um, to demand answers. Well, this is the thing. The what they have done is legislated the need to provide answers away. When the NRC says we're not required to tell you, that's exactly right. They're not required to tell us. They do not even test. Like, they test for cesium-137, 134. Those are easy tracers because they have a short life. What they can't test for is all the plutonium that they put into the Pacific Ocean or into the air or into the dirt during the insane drive for the militarization of the world right after World War II. I mean, they carpet bombed America. If you look at the map of the now, that pl plutonium is everywhere. This is why we have increasing cancers. So it's this is why I I really believe this is 
I think they're attempting to normalize the radiation rates and the cancer rates. It's like, well, that we, that's the age of, we're living it. Too bad. We're here. Tough. To, to manufacture our consent for an yeah. age decision. Yes. I mean, exactly. Exactly. Because think about it. They're having the... the they're, they're having the Olympics in, in Tokyo, which we know is radiated. And all uh, of this... When? I thought the next Olympics were in... Uh, 2020, Brazil. in 2020. Oh, okay. You think the radiation is going to go away by 2020 and the food... It's going to get worse. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I just meant... I didn't know that it worse. was in... I didn't know it was in Japan. It's going to be in 2020. It's an outrage. Uh, they're doing well, the hey, one speaking in of, Rio. Speaking of... Yeah, that's one I was familiar with. Speaking of sports, for this, uh, your listeners that are sports fans, uh, you may remember our St. Louis Rams went to Los Angeles um, to build a um, uh, to fill a stadium that was built on um, a environmentally damaged landscape. But also uh, where they had planned, which this didn't really get into much national news, uh, where they had planned to build the new stadium uh, was. Um, still uh, radiated from the uh, Mallinckrodt um, processing plant for the Manhattan Project in downtown St. Louis. Um, the the zoning would have put a parking lot over um, uh, radioactive waste for <laughs> what that's worth. Try a uh, loose connection, but... Wow. So let me ask you that. Would they have... Is that why they didn't do it? Is that why they moved to L.A.? Because of the radiation? They're like, what the heck? Cause you I, know, I, honestly, I would think the... so, but probably not. I mean, it, it probably came down to money, and there was so much dark money floating around that was unaccountable to anyone. I don't really know what the whole stadium debacle was about, just because there's no transparency on it. Well, you know what is interesting is when I looked at the map, one of the things I first noticed, you know, because I'm from Oregon, I wanted to familiarize myself. I looked at the map and I saw that the St. Louis Ram, their training center, was like in between Coldwater yeah, Creek it's... and Westlake Landfill. Their training center. Yeah, it's in that same But same what area. I would be curious to do, that would be an interesting group of people to follow, wouldn't it? I would love to see which of those men came there and trained and tracked their family's level of diabetes, schizophrenia. There's a hand. There's like five or six uh, endo endocrine problems. Those things happen before cancer when you're exposed to radiation. So your quality of life diminishes, and then you get rate. Then you a lot of times you break out with radiation or you're sterile. And but is it any wonder we hadn't won a Super Bowl in over a decade? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but you know what is interesting? Is Sorry, like, that's crude, but I have to, you know, I have to laugh about it. I have to find I would some be curious humor to, where I can. I, I would be curious to track their family history, like their children and their <laughs> families that came there to live. That would, they are a unique group of people that could be studied as a as a scientific base because they came, they lived there for a long, some of them 10 years, you know what I mean, a long period of time, and then yeah. they moved away. You know what I mean? So now they're yeah. gone. And so it'd be curious to see, track their levels of diabetes. That would be a good scientific study, don't you think, Drew? I think any long-term <laughs> epidemiological studies are in, uh, in the long run will benefit, will benefit us uh, yeah, on our understanding of nuclear yes. contamination. I know particularly with, um, uh, with Coldwater Creek, they have um, uh, CDC liaison, her name's uh, Aaron who's a, uh, epidemiolo epidemiologist and they're in the process of that and collecting data and they've worked with the community to, to put together this study and, you know, but those take time. Those take, um, you know, any epidemiological study is going to take quite a bit of time to thoroughly examine. Well, Drew, I have a spare copy. I bought, uh, two Cheers. spare copies of, uh, John Goffman's book. You're a scientific type, oh. right? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm studying uh, computer science, software engineering. Right. But do you understand, like, uh, well, I'm going to send you this book because it's a very thick book. It's a comprehensive book. He wrote it for the general public, but with the sci about his scientific studies. It's mm -hmm. ext extensive, very extensive information about their findings on what happens with radiation. You know what else you, you should look up is Dr. Gilmetti out in New Mexico. 
He's been okay. he's been studying for over thirty years. This is this is where Dana was talking to me on Friday. He gets very upset because this man's been studying beagles for thirty years. And beagles. Beagles. Testing beagles for thirty years to see how low of a dosage can they give them of americium to see before it's not harmful. What he's discovered is that there is no level of americium that is not harmful. It is a highly toxic radiological contaminant. It is outrageous. And so Dana is very, you know, he, he and his point is well taken. How long do they have to keep studying and torturing these animals? Why don't we just declare it toxic and say we need to prevent this stuff and how are we going to uh, remediate it when it gets into the atmosphere i think when it comes to policy we don't really operate on a precautionary principle we just will assume what we can get away with you know and i think that's uh that's a dangerous place to live in yeah yeah, it is a dangerous place to live in. Well, you know what it is? It's a disregard for life. That's one thing Dana and I were talking, and I agree with him. They're very nihilistic. They don't believe in the future. They're like, well, it's that's so bad that we might as well just make a billion dollars now, and you know, hopefully our families will have the best medicine, and we can. And they're going towards nanotech and all this like biotechnology. You know, well, that's, I mean, that's not so hard for me to understand, but that's unacceptable to me to, you know, sell out, even for, you know, for my generation, I'm 23, to to sell my children's, grandchildren's future. Like, uh, I guess that's where, where that, that word, worldview might differ. And um, What do your parents a, think? What do your parents think about your activism? Are they actively engaged in this uh, process? Of- uh no um <laughs> uh my mom uh is a wonderful woman she's a nurse um so she's that's kind of uh that's been something i've been struggling with to a certain degree is just my relationship my dad's in poor health and um I mean, they've always I'm supported sorry. me. I guess there's a way to answer answer your question. Well, they've always I just supported mean, me in whatever they, I've done. Do just, they believe that this is a threat to them, or do you think they think that you're just being like my daughter thinks I'm just being too? Uh, I shouldn't I shouldn't be as freaked out about it all the time because I pay attention to it and I and I watch which nuclear power plants are falling apart. I think about the air currents. I think about the fish. Like I can't go out to dinner and eat fish. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. I yeah. was out with my niece and her boyfriend. I was meeting him for the first time, and he ordered fish, and I put the menu over my eyes. I was like, uh, my mouth my mouth fell, and I said nothing, and my niece looked at me. She goes, Auntie, not one word. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this yeah. is how it goes with well, people who are paying attention. I want to change that paradigm so people can understand the reality the i i understand with there we've never uh it, it's not common for um our dinner table to discussion our dinner table discussion to um you know get to uncomfortable you know there's uncomfortable there's no uh you know there's no really bar held uh so far as openly communicating it's just uh, you know, I get a sense from my family that I feel pervades um, our our society and our in a way that it's kind of you know, well, what can we do? Uh, I don't know, or you know, or what? It's not so much what can we do; it's you know, what do we want to do? And if it's, I don't know. It's I guess it's just that there's uh, we have um, we have different. Um, um, priorities, you could say. This is a priority to me. I mean, these issues and and my education, my education, these issues, and you know, my livelihood. That's a priority for me. But you know, I'm also thinking <clears throat> if I ever want to have a family, like, I, is this the place I feel like they would be best suited? And I I can't say that. Mm-mm. No way, man. You need if you have a family, you need to be living at least away from there, on the other side of the state or upwind or downwind. You don't have to like travel to the other side of the world, but 
definitely right. you need to not be living there. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I mean, for yeah, real. But let me yeah. ask you this then, because I went through this phase with my own children where I was a little bit resentful that I can't talk to them about this. Like, I told my daughter, in fact, we talked about it the other day, and I said, look, I've gone through that phase of being upset that you, it, you guys don't care. She's like, Mom, it's not that we don't care. We're busy, and what can we do? Like, really, what can we do? I said, you know what you can do? Push back. Go on to the EPA and make a comment. You know, listen to some of the information. Listen to the information that we're getting out there. It's not just wild opinion. We give links. We encourage people to actively engage with the government because those are the people, as much as we don't like how it's set up, that's what we've got. If you well, that's part of the manufacturing consent is that we, we're led to believe that we don't have any options to engage civically. We're led to believe that we don't have any power, that our voice doesn't mean anything that you know what can you do there's no there's no short shortage of options there but i think it's when you really start to um analyze the beef of what's going on then it, the question shifts to what can i effectively do what can how can i make the most use out of my time to make a big difference and i think that's for for me personally um is to um to dig and to publish and to ask questions and um, on your website the Missouri Accountability Project do you have published dot org, uh, sci- uh, dot org. I apologize That's okay. uh, Missouri and it's it, do they spell out the whole thing or is it MAP dot org no nah, MAP dot org was taken it's, oh, it was, okay. it's spelled out so it's the Missouri Accountability Project dot org okay great correct. so that's the correct one if they want to find you Yes, and I'm, your li- listeners will be on, uh, will hear us tomorrow. But um, we've uh, revamped, redesigned, streamlined our website to make it more user friendly. Awesome. Um, yeah, so that's kind of that's what we've been up to, uh, aside from keeping on top of uh, latest reports and um, publishing those findings. You're a computer person, right? That's what you're studying, yeah. correct? Yeah. So, like, you mm-hmm. know what would be really sweet? I'm just going to say this on the air so that maybe uh, the people who I'm going to speak about can uh, engage with you. I think it would be really awesome if your site, Donna Gilmore's site, the uh, Radcast, all these uh, really awesome anti-nuclear sites could all mm-hmm. interlink so it be on each other's pages so that when you click on one page you automatically on the front page there's a link to see all these other pages that give you the same information like mm-hmm. information pursuant to their area you know what I mean like people yeah. will come to your site but they might not know that like the radcast.org is publishing all this information and doing initiatives to shut down the Columbia Generating Station well, here's what we can do, Lonnie. This, I'm glad you brought this up because, um, that, as some of your listeners may know, we've done interviews in the past, and so we're keeping this archive of um, of information. And on the front page where we've moved our archive, there's a tab um, for Age of Fission for, for your radio. It's a YouTube playlist, but if you'd like to gather some sources, um, present those to me. I'd, um, you know, that wouldn't. Yes, wouldn't take I, any time to to include that in our in our uh, with our resources. Well, I can give you some uh, signed copies of scientific journals that I think are still public domain. Especially if you're yeah. a student, you right. can access a lot of these things. Yes. And that's what yeah, I've done. yeah, that's uh, a huge benefit to being a student. I have huge. access to me too. To these me databases too. And, uh, that's how I found that uh, talk by Dr. Weinberg from 1972, mm-hmm. where he called themselves. That's where that whole nuclear priesthood phrase came from. Was him? He coined it. He said, mm-hmm. you know, humanity has entered into a Faustian agreement with us, and you now have to trust the nuclear priesthood to protect you from now until infinity because this stuff is going to require protection. <laughs> you can't. And that is really. That's, do you know about this also, Drew? Are they doing the same thing in St. Louis where they want to just bury it, shake their hands, and say, okay, we're done now? And then Cap it and leave it. Yeah, that's what they want to do in many places around the country. It's a so it's up to us as citizens of this country to not allow that to happen because these are government agencies. That's what I think. 
Absolutely. I mean, the Department of Energy, they're one of the principal responsible parties here um, on with Westlake. And this is it does come back to it. It comes back to a federal issue. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that it went under the jurisdiction of EPA. I don't feel like their infrastructure, their bureaucracy, their funding um, or, you know, to disregard their um, the intent of their founding. But I don't they're, they're, they seem unequipped to uh, to handle the extent of uh, the waste uh, problem that we have in this country. And it's, I think, worth noting um, that House Bill 4100, uh, which many of you may have been following, uh, which transfers jurisdiction of Westlake from EPA to Army Corps of Engineers. Um, my take on this, it's it's in the House now, uh, it, and um, House is out on recess. Um, and for those of you familiar with how the House works or doesn't work, um, committees are typically where bills are sent to die. And, you know, if they don't make it out of committee in a timely fashion, then um, I really question the, um, the, the political will behind them. And I just found it curious that the uh, Missouri Senate introduced um, their version of the bill uh, just before the holidays fundraising season for the upcoming election. Um, it's legislation that went passed unanimously through the Senate, um, but ultimately died in the House. So uh, I think it's important for um, for us, wherever you live in the country and whatever your issues are locally, to take a hard look at all of your candidates this election season. Uh, this is a pinnacle election. Uh, to take a hard look at um, what they've done and where they stand and uh, who's funding their campaigns. Um, and so, well, uh, <laughs> I don't have much hope, maybe a vestige of one. Uh, this, this election could be a huge turning point for better or worse. Well, if people would still stay engaged, even though there is just massive efforts to make us not want to be engaged, it's like even on this issue, the we, this bill basically was put on, in, under, under committee and uh, Congressman Frank Pallone Jr. sat on mm. it and refused to approve it because he wants money for his own district. That's essentially what they're saying. There's so little money. They're fighting over whose district is the most toxic, essentially. That's what they're saying. I mean, it's so outrageous. Like, why can't we just give them more money? Why do we have to say, why can't we cut out money for Saudi Arabia or for Qatar or for the CIA or for, you know what I mean? Like, there are places to dig in the funding that we could pay for these things. This is urgent for the health of our country. It's not, it's not, this is not uh, optional. But it threatens the illusion of power and control of our state, of our system, it, you know. Uh, to to admit there's a problem, you know, is to yeah, someone's responsible for it. And if someone's responsible, they're you know, financially responsible. I, to be honest, um, I can't help but think about that kid that was killed. We're pre-recording this on Sunday. Today is July 17th. We're going to play this on the air tomorrow, July 18th. And I am still in shock that a, a 27-year-old DNC staffer was shot for no apparent reason four times with a bullet. So that was no mistake. And the police are saying, gee, we have, it's a random act of violence. He lives in D.C. Violence happens. No, that's not how it happens. He was about to give a report on the election fraud. So what happened to him? I mean... Off you go. Uh, you know, they want us to vote for this person? No. And then we have the other option, you know, like Trump could get in and he could say, oh, I don't feel like doing it. I'm going to give it to Mike Pence. Then we'd have President Pence, which is like really the worst option in the world. He's far worse than Trump. I mean, Mike Pence wants gay people to go to conversion therapy. Pray the gay way. Hallelujah. <laughs> So this is where we're at, Drew. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Yikes. Glad to meet you here, Lonnie. Yeah. And we're talking about the radiation in your city and the and not just the radiation, but the chemical and the pollution. It's not just mm -hmm. the radiation. You guys are being I, this health physicist that I was speaking to through Coldwater Creek mentioned this. He was saying 
The chemical pollution there is far a far greater immediate threat right away to the people of St. Louis. He goes, I've been arguing with the people, the anti-nukers here. He goes, but it's a very serious thing. A lot of what you don't see, you can't smell. It's it's horrible. It's just like the nuclear. It's just as bad. So Yeah, there was a recent, uh, there was an epidemiological study. It was a multi-site covert epidemiological study uh, looked at um I think 14 municipal landfills in Italy um, and looked at their sulfur compound concentrations. Um, and over uh, like 15 years, they studied the morbidity and mortality. People uh, five clicks, resident people living five clicks away, uh, found an increased rate of um, lung cancer and you know, morbidity and mortality just just from the you know the instance of living next to a landfill. And you know, for those not familiar with Richland landfill particularly. Um, it's not a healthy landfill. The hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, all these different sulfur compounds and methane and um, O2, they're, uh, they're not like any other site. Um, it may not be literally uh, licking flames, but what's there is hot enough to give off, um, give off a lot of pollution. And um, Republic Services uh, isn't... Uh, typically willing to account for for those emissions or um, you know when you think about living next to and they you know they're telling us this could um, this fire could burn for another 10 years and uh, there's no way to put it out there's just no way We've, we we don't know any way uh, to put this out so um, the way I'm looking at it is they're they're burning their trash uh, so they don't have to deal with it and we have to deal with that if it were up to them for a decade uh, when you think about how much life you live in, in 10 years, um, I can think about when I was 13. It's been going for five, so it's going to be a total of a minimum 15. Right. That's what I mean. I just, I, from standing here today, I feel very grateful looking forward that, you know, the time frame I was referencing. But, um, yeah, we've been living with this for, uh, at least with the with the emissions and the stench and the odor. And, honestly, it's an embarrassment. Uh, that's... <laughs> Uh, I think a lot of people feel embarrassed uh, in their in their local and their um, their state agencies that you know, yeah. let them uh, that that put up with this. And, um, yeah, so. that is an embarrassment. Think about that. Like, and the, you know, it's funny because here in Eugene we have uh, you know what we call stinky smelly hippies, like literally people you can smell from across the table. <laughs> Like, seriously, I've never moved to a place where you could actually smell someone when they walk in the room. I did yeah. when I moved here. But that's because they live in, I mean, they live like people did 100 years ago where they don't bathe but once a week and they wash their yeah. clothes once a month. And hey, at least they're living. And they're happy and they're great people yeah. and, like, whatever. So God bless you. You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> but... It's weird to think about that the whole city has to put up with this. Every man, woman, and child living there. Every police officer, every firefighter, every judge, every teacher, every doctor, every, person, every nurse, everyone. Everybody there is just putting up with it. How many people are putting up with that stench, would you say? Ooh, uh, at least, I don't know, then like within five clicks, probably. Mm, 30, 40,000 people. Uh, wow. That's a guesstimate. Wow. Wow. And there is no major urge to, like, organize and take to the streets. Like, every Saturday, every Sunday, have 30,000 people come out. Like, just place themselves somewhere in just one place and say, we're not leaving until you pay attention to this. Yeah. I think that's what this is culminating to. And... Um, I, I think there's a reluctance here with our, with our recent experience and to, to organize in mass numbers on the streets. I mean, it's, it's, it's not safe. Um, you know, people die when that happens and like, I don't think everyone's really willing to take that risk or even acknowledge it. What do you mean? Um, but, you mean when well, people I take just, to the streets in St. Louis, you're afraid of the uh, security guards? Uh, the yeah, the National Guard. I mean, it's, the police I think officers, the militarized police that would show up and yeah, pick a yeah, fight. Yeah, it's more than it's more than just protest fatigue. It's more than just you know 
saying, "Ah, oh, well, you know, I got a lot of shit going on." I think it's a it's a legitimate fear of the militarized police force. Uh, I've seen what that looks like. I've I've looked down the barrel of it. I've you know taken pictures pictures and, and witnessed it. And um, you and were telling a story. So I know about that's real. But they actually held a, a a gun to your head. It had rubber bullets. Oh yeah, yeah. We were talking about um, you know military procedure and like um, convention and rules of engagement. You don't raise your weapon um, unless you intend to fire it. And uh, yeah, they had. Um, armed uh soldiers with um with 50 caliber sniper rifles presumably armed with rubber bullets i would hope are, so are you black but they had trained are you black <laughs> aren't we all a little black uh no well, i mean i just thought my i'd family, ask if you were african american because no you know, i usually I'm answer a, multicultural i um have but, roots in but native americans look, and african americans and and europeans did, did uh, your skin look dark Irish though are you dark skin? um I, I have a I have a tan complexion. I don't because know. I, the it, reason I ask is all the video, all the feeds we got here about that situation showed us that the police officers were aiming the guns at black people. Yeah, I mean that's the media the, the the media narrative. But I think what's more dangerous than the color of your skin is a camera. Um, oh, you know, you as a journalist, a as a witness, oh. I always have a camera. Uh, that that scares someone more than uh, that scares police more than the color of your skin. Uh, there was an article that ran uh, in the Post-Dispatch about the Florissant Police Department, which they're just entrenched with this uh, old guard, you know, white supremacists and people who know the history of North County St. Louis and white wow. flight and Florissant, you know, they would kind of get the context, but, you know, the article headline was uh, shut up, we're red, and that, you know, cameras are on, you know, and that's just that's a prevailing culture. It's the thin blue line, um, and yeah. uh, that the the difference now being that we've spent trillions of dollars, uh, to, given trillions of dollars to the military industrial complex, and we're just oversaturated. So we've armed our police forces to the teeth, and you know it's like walking down the streets of Baghdad, but um, fifteen minutes from my house, and uh, I just can't really describe how that changes your worldview and uh, your perspective of things. I remember walking down, um, I was taking a friend home from work that, that lived in that, lived in that area. And this was, uh, I think right before or during, um, the announcement that there would be no indictment. And, um, you know, we walk in numbers cause that's safe. Um, and you know, I, I just remember walking up to a uh, county police officer and he uh, grabs his assault rifle that he had slung around his back um, and readies it. Doesn't doesn't lift it, but he readies it and says, hands where I can see them, papers now. Um, wow. You know, that's the kind of language you hear at a check stop in Palestine. That's the kind of language you hear under martial law. And the that Gestapo was, says that. That's, yeah, your you know, papers now, and for you know, I I what do you say? Was hands very above fort- your head? No, no, no. Hands where I can see them. Hands where I can see them. Assuming your that papers you now. might be a potential threat to him. Yeah, and so wow. you know, there's uh, I have an option of how to respond in that how moment, old were you and when that happened? I can. This was last year. This uh, yeah, 2015. Wow. Um, so there's some options for how I can respond in that situation. I can respond with obedience and submittal and give him the role of authority, or I can, I can view him as a human being. And I just, I talked to him and I said, I don't have my papers. I used his language, but I don't have my papers and I don't need my papers. We're walking home. They just got off of work and, you know, we're, we're unarmed and, um, we asked him, you know, I said, are we free to go? Uh, can we, can we move past here? Um, are we under arrest? And he, I mean, I could tell he was from the area and I could tell the way that we responded to him with respect, made a connection, you know, so he wasn't belligerent beyond that. He just explained that that side of the street was closed and that there were no access to those neighborhoods, um, that they had locked down the block, um, and that we had to find another, another way home or somewhere else to be. Like you just 
you just can't be here. But it was it was his reaction to us, you know, as a group of people to to see us as a threat, to see us as as criminals until we proved to him otherwise. And wow. to why were the streets closed? Uh, there were um, there was, a kid got shot that night. Um, it was the night of the indictment. Um, he was. I mean, that was the night that that uh, what was his name? Michael uh, Brown. Not a, no, no, no. This was this was a year after when the Another grand jury decided not shot. to indict. Another person got shot. There were, yeah. I mean, unless unless you were paying attention, you wouldn't know. But there's, yeah, the killing never stopped. <laughs> the killing never stopped. Is it still ongoing? Is there still like a little subterranean war going on in St. Louis? I mean, not just in St. Louis. Everywhere, I feel like it's. Um, I think it's the militarization of the police. It's the militarization of the police. Getting back to it, it that's my point. That really, that's the you know people. Uh, this lady that I know in Kentucky, she's like, Black Lives Matter is going to protest and they're threatening people. I'm like, look, I support Black Lives Matter because it's not about them. It's about the militarized police. And unfortunately, black people and people of color feel the brunt of the racism, the encouraged racism in this country. Look at that Indian man who got through. He was visiting his daughter, an elderly Indian man walking down the street somewhere in the USA, caught on camera. And he didn't understand. He didn't speak English, and he was like, "Huh, mm-hmm. huh?" They he, because he didn't immediately comply. Two grown men threw him to the ground on concrete, and he is now paralyzed from the neck down for doing yeah. nothing in the United States. We'll break that, back. And you know what? We act like that's no big deal because the cops did it. We have to just accept that. Be, that nine-year-old child got killed last year because the cop was a lunatic and shot a child. And he just got transferred to another police department, and we have to accept that. You get stopped in your own neighborhood and told to, you know, put your hands in front of you and hand me your papers because a kid got shot? They want to know who you are? Like, for real? This is America, Drew? Is that what we are creating in America? Is that what our elected officials are allowing? Yes, that's what I see. Anyway, we get conscientious objectors, and this is what I say. When, in fact, let's mention this. Please go to the EPA's website before the twenty fifth. In our last interview, we said ah. it was the twenty seventh. It's actually the twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. Yep. So go there. We'll put a link in this interview about you know how to get to the docket number. Click on it. There, on Make your comments. Missouri, I'll share you the link on MissouriAccountabilityProject.org so you can have it for Well, let's for do the, both. Do it on yeah, yeah. so that you it's can on the front have page your also. own and then do your own. I'll provide a link on this when I put the radio show together, when I give it to Jewel. Well, I'll give both of them because do it twice. Do it on theirs to give Missouri Accountability Project some some feet. You know what I mean? Some peoples like some voice. If they have a lot of people going through their link, it gives them more power and more political, quote, political power. Am I correct well, there, Drew? It, no, well, it gives people their power. Um, but I wanted to mention also, um, I think we had brought this up when we first discussed, um, if you have any questions regarding these new protective action guidelines, um, please feel free. You know, we're, We'll provide you with as much information as we can, but please feel free if you have any questions reach out to either of us you can reach us through our website um for any inquiries and you know we're we're preparing um a a collaborative uh public comment so if there's anything you'd like included uh, you any have questions? Like a summary page of this of uh, the changes at the EPA. Actually, if you we, open up the docket and you read yeah. it, it's an outrage. They do say what they're going to do. I can't believe yeah. they're actually like Putting it out there so bluntly. Yeah, transparent, yeah. It's like, say what? Like, I opened up the docket expecting gobbledygook, but uh, the big most important part is pretty clearly stated. They're going to poison us. What they're going to do is tell us that, hey, folks, there's uh, there's been a nuclear <laughs> meltdown, so now we've changed the radiation rates, and uh, you're fine because you're in the allowable limit, and when it gets over a certain point, we'll let you know while the nuclear radiation is going on. Only it's thousands of times higher than it should be. <laughs> You're going to be poisoned. Everything is under control. 
Everything is okay. <laughs> obey, consume. Yes, obey, consume. And don't even think about talking up. And that's what we have to break. That's what we have to yeah. break. And we're asking yeah. people to go to the Missouri Accountability Project. Don't give up on attempting to engage people. And I think it's extremely important to be respectful and to listen to people yeah. and their points of view. Yeah. Because people are convinced that they're right. All of us, like, pro-nukers talk to me like, oh, you've just been brainwashed. No, I'm looking at the oncology rates. I'm looking at, like, the mass animal die-offs that are going on around the planet because since the last 70 years, we've had nothing but nuclear pollution, technology pollution. We have... Drew, am I incorrect? We're living... You know, no, we're living the sixth mass extinction uh, it's presently. Mean, the... U That's United thing, Nation <laughs> named <laughs> these big islands of trash, Trashlandia, so they can discuss them. Oh, I have an idea about that. Oh, you might get a kick out of this, and I think your listeners might also. So the the Pacific Trash Island, right? Yeah. That's what you're talking about? Trash it's massive, Landia. and it, most of it's, yeah, most of it's plastics, which is crazy. But what if, what if we could take that plastic, feed it through a 3D printing um ship, you know, a 3D printing manufacturing uh, ship and recycle it, turn it in to a platform that serves three purposes, harvesting solar energy, geothermal energy, which is now possible, and water desalination. Um, you know why I bet just a that thought. probably... Just a thought. I, well, those are great ideas, but how would that interact with uh, radiation? Does radiation interact ah, with any of those processes? I, I knew you'd ask that. I'm glad you brought it up because I do. Um, yeah, radiation, you cannot remove radiation from water. Once radiation is contaminated water, it's there. There's no treatment process. There's no possible way. Um, right, Albert Einstein's written on this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, uh, there's no possible way. So, you know, we're really breaching into... Um, an era now where you know the earth is made up of 70% of water but a third of 1% of that water is um fresh uh is uh fresh water groundwater surface water water that we can drink use, yes. and use and we're soiling it we're soiling it not just for us we're soiling it for our children we're soiling it for our grandchildren our grandchildren's grandchildren and it's well, the this it's and also and the the, the entire earth i mean that more broadly i mean we're we're in this interconnected spaceship spaceship earth and this is the only one we got for right now you know dreamers are talking about mars but you know we can't terraform mars unless we can terraform earth and we can't terraform earth if our rivers our mountains our creeks our streams um are are contaminated with this with this waste that that we continue to accumulate. We continue to produce more of um, you know this uh, economic system we found ourselves in requires an infinite growth, infinite growth of uh, profits of returns and uh, infinite resources. But we don't have infinite resources. Um, the resources we have are precious and they're also shared. Uh, not any one of us have any claim to to our water, to, to our air, to our soil. Um, but we have this illusion that we do. We have this illusion to, that That's we can just, CEO that we can take a claim. Said. No, no. And did, did, that's, you, did you see the CEO yes. of Nestle Corporation said, no, water is not a human it's right. It's not a human right, no. So, yes, it is a human right. But this is the point here, Drew. Okay, all of that is correct, but how do we get... See, this is this is what we're facing. Like, we are so overly polluted, and people are so overwhelmed. They feel like they're so overwhelmed. And it reminds me of those women who have been abducted who never run away when they go to the grocery yeah. store, yeah. who don't scream out and yell. You know what I mean? Like, And then it, after time, it turns into Stockholm Syndrome. And we begin, you know, we've, we create a prison, and we're, we're the guards and the prisoners. You know, it's... It's sick. It's psychological warfare. 
Well, that is exact, and it's all planned. And so now that we're aware of this, this is why, like, it's, this is why, frankly, like, I have not given up on St. Louis, even though very few people have really, they talk to me, and then they kind of get cold feet when they start realizing it might reflect on my husband's job. I might, she might say something about somebody, you know what I mean? Like, because really, it's the polluters. I, this is the hardest part about St. Louis that is a difficult story to comprehend, and it makes me understand two things. A, what's happened in St. Louis is happening in many communities across the United States. Only the difference is yours is on fire and it is escaping through the air. And it it's a magnitude. Like yours, guys, is on Balco. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's other communities that have uranium tailings and other communities that have nuclear pollution and the kids are just as sick. Everybody's dying. But you guys have air that smells like horrible eggs, worse than that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. From what I've been told. And it's nonstop. And it's not just from nuclear. It's from all the chemicals. And it's just, it's so, I'm still nonplussed at the lack of regard for human life that your own elected officials can just brush this off and not bring in the military and say you know what we're going to fix this one way or the other we have the, yeah. you know the united states military actually does manage its nuclear waste pretty decently when it does yeah the, the u.s army corps of engineers formerly utilized site remedial action program um they're technically they're contractors of the government and they're not technically military quote unquote um but yeah they have they have a great track record of um this is why i am just nonplussed that it's been allowed to die in legislation that the other like my own congressman like i'm I can't believe him. Like, he's not jumping up and down. These people need to, like, hold a sit-in for the people of St. Louis. I mean, honestly, that whole stupid little gun control thing. We're going to sit down like three-year-olds and park ourselves until you do something about gun control. Really? Shut up. Like, for real. <laughs> like, honestly. It had so many opportunities to do something prior to that. I, I don't know. That seemed like a stunt. But. It's it is a stunt, and because actually all of these things, I actually believe a lot of these are stunts. That's a perfect word. I think they are stunts. Political I mean, theater. You know, yes, we're not talking about Hillary Clinton being a criminal and the Clinton Foundation not filing a single paper, a shred of paper. All the money they took in from Haiti, not one piece of paper has been filed. Not one piece of paper. I, 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 that is that to me. After that young kid in the DNC being murdered, is like who the heck? I actually, you know, Drew. I called up Senator Sheehan's office and I said that to her in their office. I was dumbfounded that they're supporting her. So mm. I, I, even Claire McCaskill's office, I said this to. Like I'm just dumbfounded that these women are fault bobbleheading after her because dumbfounded is a good word. I, there's one thing I, you know. Particularly worth noting, I'm surprised this hasn't yet tanked her camp. But oh, the whole uh, 28 pages uh, of the 9/11 Commission report detailing the Saudi connection to um, to the 9/11 um, plots, and um, you know, Saudi Arabia is one of her largest campaign contributors. A, a Your phone's clicking out there, brother. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. How can you dare hear me now? we talk about <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I see. I get it. <laughs> That's how it works. Start talking. I actually have started after she killed that kid last Sunday. I call her uh, Hillary Monsanto Stalin Clinton because she gets the name of Stalin on her. She's just got way too many dead people in her in her trail. I mean, she will stop at nothing. Uh, honestly, I mean. I kind of beginning to worry for Bill Clinton. She's kind of a black widow spider. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> she might have had enough of him already. I mean, for real. No offense, but oof. I'm not a big Bill Clinton fan, but I don't want anybody to like be 86 in their sleep or something. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, to go too far into that. But I'm curious. You know, it, I, I'm curious to what degree their, you know, their relationship has held up, or if they're not just a power couple. Like I, I assume you've seen House of Cards no. on Netflix, the Netflix series. Uh -uh. I mean, it's, never. Oh, 
basically a documentary of our political theater, but you know, they just seem like a, a power couple at this point that just they're financially tied and well, I think it's been said that they're like uh they're not really part of that upper one percent of one percent, they're just the well paid servants mm. of the upper one percent. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're yeah. on the yeah. bottom the very top fringe of the ninety nine percent and they're just very expensive. They're and holding they're, on they're there. Very yeah. obedient servants. They will do whatever it takes. And they have built like they can you imagine the chutzpah it takes to take in all that money to get on sit with Bush and go to Haiti and say, Let's mm-hmm. donate and they billions of dollars and not nobody, there's not one tax return done, not one declaration of any project, nothing. Nothing no accountability, no transparency. But it's like the chutzpah it takes to like, who, I'm running for president. Like, what do you think? I don't, I don't manage that. Who cares? What are you talking about? You're being a conspiracy theorist, expecting me to know about that. Really? That's the person we're having run our country. I don't think so. So, anyways, we could get off on that one because I know the Democratic Party's uh, the convention is this week. I'm still encouraging people to contact their super delegates and tell their super delegates to give their Democratic vote to Bernie inside the convention because if he came out, we might not have uh, the Trump Pence presidency that is a pending if they give it to if they give it to her. That's what I think. Yep. Drew Kuhn from the Missouri Accountability Project. Thank you for joining us. We have about three minutes left. Uh, tell our listeners how they can find you again. And one, do they? Is there a phone number or an email address? Uh, yeah, there. Uh, I have an email address. Uh, you can go to MissouriAccountabilityProject.org/contact. Uh, there's a um, there's a form there um, where you can reach out, and that'll go to my email through through a proxy and um, we'll get in touch. Uh, I appreciate to your listeners um, for spending your Monday with us. And uh, I encourage you to um, ask questions, to think for yourself, to vote. Um, and even to, if you think voting doesn't matter, you think it's worth Even it. if you think it doesn't, do it anyway, if you can. Um, if you can, huh. as what? How yeah. many? How many votes in California? Yeah, if you can. One point five. Fifteen percent. Fifteen percent were flipped. Fifteen percent. Yeah. Two percent, no and we investigate for election fraud in other countries. Wow! No. Because we can't have any dictators over there. Yeah, no wonder that kid got murdered last week. That's pretty serious. Wow. Well, the Missouri Accountability Project, making them accountable. Thank you for that 15% statistic. This is the kind of brilliant information we find from Drew Kuhn. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. You're such a delight to talk to. And the, you, you are a perfect role model. You're 23, 24 years old. And you know what? Instead of whining and complaining about how screwed up the situation is because he's living just miles away from these uh, burning dump sites, he's getting an education. He's actively engaged. He works for the water supply company he's doing his research he's staying engaged honestly my hat's off to you drew thank you so much for showing us how to put our courage feet on cheers thank you Lonnie. well thank you and uh to all of our listeners do put your courage feet on find a way to get actively engaged and please do pay attention and even if you think it's not going to matter Get politically active. Push back. Don't let these guys just run all over us. Please make your comments known at the EPA website. We'll have links below. And thank you for joining us. Put your courage feet on. and Don't we'll mourn, organize. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't mourn, organize. What a great phrase. Don't mourn, organize. Yeah, exactly. well,
Yeah.